So, the, uh, the, for, so for a while, um, Ivy's going to be talking about what she's doing. Uh, and then we're going to be making sense of that from a sustainability perspective. So I put a few little, a few prompts for you to think about, but you may be interested in other things that Ivy's saying. because She's going to be giving you a sense of a rich context uh, and all the things going on with that context. The idea is after this, we'll have a discussion, okay, around some of the things that Ivy has been saying. First of all, in small groups. And Alex, uh, if you'd like to join in that discussion, you'd be very welcome. And then as a, as a whole group. And the idea is to start thinking about concepts and looking at how they're being realized in practice in different places, okay? Alrighty, so without more ado. Okay. Okay, hello everyone and thank you very much Susan for having me here today. Um, today I'm going to talk about SDG 4, that's Sustainable Development Goal 4, and how that is playing out in Bangladesh through a project called the Multimedia Classroom Project. So I'm going to try to give you a sense of the international um, context and then how that is realised in the national context and then how that is realised in a very local context. So kind of going from the macro to the micro. Just to say, Harvey, that we're kind of introducing SDG for yeah. yeah. So, uh, what happened? Oh. Okay. So first I'm going to talk about SDGs, SDG 4, which is quality education. Then I'm going to talk about the national context. I'm going to share two stories. One is a child called Rashid. One is a teacher who's trying to realize this in her own way. Her name is Henna. And then, as Susan said, at the end, we're trying to make, we will try to make sense of all of this together in relation to sustainability, sustainable development, and ultimately what is education, all of these things. Um, Susan gave you some prompts. I have some prompts too. So um, what I want to kind of explore today through this is what is quality education to different people all around the world, international, national, local, everyone. And one question while I'm going through this is uh, that I want everyone to kind of um, think about is should Rashid when I share his story, and his home be a separate issue to <coughs> quality education. Um, regarding Henna, how is the digital or technology helping Henna change? How is she exercising agency? Or is she changing at all? Is it changing education at all? So the digital education and sustainability, how are they intersecting? And it's not quite straightforward. It's not linear in this context. And how could the digital help achieve quality education, enhance education, or does it not have any role at all? So thinking a bit critically about technology here in relation to the sustainable development goals and education as a whole. I'll come back to these later. So SDG 4. SDG means Sustainable Development Goals. It's a development agenda agreed on by United Nation, um, United Nation member states. So we have about 189 countries who are part of the United Nations and they developed on these development goals. There are 17, 17 development goals and the member states will try to achieve them from uh, in the time frame of 2015 to 2030. So within these 17 goals, we have SDG 1, like uh, reducing poverty, then um, ensuring health for everyone, ensuring a balanced ecosystem in the world, ensuring justice, uh, just society. So we have all of these different kinds of goals within, within those 17 goals. SDG 4 is of particular interest to us because we're working in education and it says quality education to be achieved by 2030 across the world. Now, why was this important? If we look at the United Nations report, 
in 2018, 57 million primary school aged children across the world still do not attend school, not even primary school. And within those 57 million primary school children, 80% live in the rural areas. So the rural is, there is a very big gap between the rural and the urban across the world. And this divide is seen as to be one of the major barri barriers to achieving universal primary education. That's why SDG 4 is so important. It is looking into ways on how we can include all of these children, especially from the rural areas. Another thing is more than half of the children, so within the people who are attending, they are not achieving the minimum quality of education. So it, um, the United Nations looked at the proficiency standards in reading and mathematics and 50% children, even though they had finished education, did not achieve the required quality <coughs> at the age. So it's not also uh, about inclusion, it's also about quality of education. So everyone will get a minimum standard so that they can have the skills required to navigate through their life. Um, so, so what United Nations said is we need more trained teachers across the world to achieve quality education. And for least developed countries, that's LDCs, these problems are, um, there are even more problems in schools. For instance, children in these schools do not have access to basic sanitation, hand washing facilities. So United Nations is also looking into that. So all of these come under SDG 4 or quality education and all of the member states are trying to achieve this or um, make quality of uh, enhance the quality of education in their country. Um, quality education SDG 4 specifically states as its aim, this is the aim. So ensure inclusive so everyone will have access, there will be participation from everyone. Um, despite their gender, despite their location, urban, rural, and equitable quality. That is, the quality will be the same for everyone. To that, they also added promote lifelong learning opportunities. So it's not only that when you leave school, you stop learning, like um, Alex said today. You, there's this sense of trying to learn throughout your life, through each other. And um, the member states are looking into how that can be achieved to promote these lifelong learning opportunities in our societies. Um, so that's briefly about SDG 4. Now let's look, that's the international context on what's going on at the moment. Now let's look into Bangladesh. So Bangladesh as a member state of the United Nations is committed to the SDGs or sustainable development goals, and it is trying very hard to achieve them by 2030. Um, before implementation of these SDGs, um, Bangladesh had a very traditional education system. So if you look at the classrooms, they're crowded, lots of students, not very good seating facilities, fixed benches, and maybe a blackboard in the classroom. The teacher-student ratio is like um, out of balance. So you can sometimes have 100, 120 students per teacher in the primary schools. Um, and if you look at the pedagogy, it's said to be teacher-centered. So the teacher reads from the textbook, the student listens. So it's kind of a passive absorption of information rather than interactive and creatively learning. Um, there is a fixed curriculum that the teachers need to kind of um, follow word by word, so they cannot be creative in their classrooms. Um, uh, this is also kind of exaggerated by the testing system, which also tests memorized definitions and things like that. So all of this together is contributing to a textbook centered, teacher centered um, education system in the country. So what happened is when Bangladesh committed to SDG 4, they said that we need to bring change in what is the traditional, what the traditional education system looks like. So the government of Bangladesh thought that we want to do this by digitalizing our classroom. 
and their concept of digitalizing the classroom included that they will establish multimedia classrooms across the rural areas, primary schools, specifically in rural areas. They will um, equip classrooms with a multimedia projector and a laptop, which is chargeable through solar power. And they will give teachers a bit of data and teachers will make PowerPoints or will bring visuals to the classroom to complement the verbal mode of classroom teaching. So before that, it was just the teacher was speaking or the the uh, children were reading from the textbooks. Now the teachers will be able to show videos, animations. And the government thought that that would help students to understand very hard concepts and also remember the information. So an example the government gives is that before, when teachers in primary schools were teaching about solar systems, they would read that the um, sun orbits on its own axis, the uh, earth orbits on its own axis, and they orbit each other. Uh, the Earth orbits the Sun, but the students were not being able to kind of visualize it just by reading it. Now the teacher can show how the solar system works and the students will be able to better understand. That's how the government thinks that they can improve the quality of education and contribute to SDG 4. Now, in relation to that, the government also um, created this website called Batayon. In Bengali, that means teacher's garden. So here, what the teachers are supposed to do throughout the country is the PowerPoints that they make, they're going to upload there in the website. So one teacher can look at another teacher's PowerPoint, use it in their classroom if necessary. Um, they can modify it. They can provide feedback. They can rate the PowerPoint. So it's kind of a sharing kind of community over there. And the government says that this contributes to lifelong learning opportunities for teachers because we do not have enough trainers to train teachers. Instead of that, if we are to improve the quality of education and provide lifelong learning opportunities, this can work to contribute to that. So this is how SDG 4 is interpreted by the government of Bangladesh. Now, one thing um, very important here, if you can see over here, <coughs> This. So based on the rating that the teachers get um, in this area, um, a best teacher is chosen. So they are called the best multimedia teachers and they are featured over there for the whole country to see. They are awarded in a national award giving ceremony. They get media coverage. So it's the government's way of kind of um, motivating the teachers to contribute to the website and also giving them a kind of recognition for the work that they are putting in into all of this. So that's the best teacher award. And that really kind of motivated a lot of teachers. And when this started, the government's intention was because United Nations says there's this big gap between rural and the urban. The government kind of thought that the urban teachers will be teaching the rural teachers about how to teach in classrooms. So the rural teachers can use the PowerPoints from the urban teachers here and see how urban teachers are taking their classrooms and improve the quality of education. So that's how the government thought that this massive gap between the quality of education in the rural and the urban can be overcome. So that's how it's interpreted in Bangladesh. So just a few things that the government put in their policy document is multimedia, they believe, is an agent in promoting interest and interaction. So the government thinks that if you bring multimedia inside, students will be more interested in their classrooms. And that will also contribute to resisting the drop, drop off rate. So decreasing the drop off rate by creating interest. And the government also believes that it might increase the attendance rate. So students who are not very interested to come to the classroom may find the classroom to be a very fun, interactive place and start attending. So that's how um, they, take, they think that they can take care of participation or more inclusive education. So again, through this, they wanted to create this student-centered pedagogy. So a teacher, they thought that students will interact more with visuals rather than the textbook or the verbal mode. And that will contribute to SDG 4 and connecting teachers to the portal. 
would create a way for lifelong learning opportunities and improve the quality of education. Um, for a visual, this is a poster by the government of Bangladesh, and this is how they see quality education. So here it's written, uh, quality education leading to sustainable development. And this is how they visualize it. If you can see, it's a very digital kind of classroom. Can you see it? The drones. Um, so um, there's drones, there's communication, collaboration happening with another country. There's um, There are robots in the classroom, so artificial intelligence. Um, there's iPads, so it's a very digital kind of um, interpretation of quality education and sustainable development. Um, besides this, there was another poster that has been heavily advertised in media. So that kind of says that you need to create interaction and enjoyment for the students. So not only is it digital, but there's a lot of emphasis on creating fun and interaction in the classroom so that more students are interested in attending uh, schools. So visually, that's how the government puts it, SDG4 for Bangladesh. Now from here, so the international context, SDG4, national context, SDG4, these are all macro or wider policy um, interpretations of what quality education is. Now what we're going to do is go into one of the islands in Bangladesh, a very small island, and see what all of this is coming to be in that island. So this island is called Hatia. It's here. This one over here. It's detached from the mainland, as you can see. It takes about 16 hours from the capital via the river and the sea to reach Hatia. Now, why Hatia is important is it is one of the most remotest islands in Bangladesh. And because it's detached from the mainland, it's not connected to the national electricity grid. So it doesn't have any power source. The only power it generates is through local generators and solar power. But that only provides about two to three hours of electricity some days. The solar panels are usually given to schools, which is enough to kind of um, light a bulb, charge the laptops, get the projector going. On days it's sunny, but this is a tropical island, so there's lots of rain, there's lots of cyclones and hurricanes. So you can see that this island doesn't have um, the infrastructure that you need to make this kind of digital uh, vision possible at all. Um, I was particularly interested in Hatia because you remember I talked about the Best Teacher Award. So in 2012, when the Best Teacher Award was being given, and everyone kind of thought it would go to an urban teacher because it was designed for urban teachers to teach rural teachers, it went to a primary school teacher, a female primary school teacher from Hatia. She had been the one who had contributed the most to the website and her PowerPoints got the highest rating. So that kind of shook the media and the country because it was very different to what was expected. Since 2012 to 2018, female primary teachers from Hatia have been receiving the award. So it's a very, in, at the beginning, it was a very intriguing case for me what's happening and why the last place that anyone could imagine is getting this again and again. My PhD journey started from here because I was interested to know how they are engaging with technology, what it means to them, what is, why is this happening? So um, a bit about Hatia, it's a tourist spot. It ha it, because it's a tropical island, lovely wildlife, greenery, you can see there's deer, it's beautiful, but the tragedy is, as I said, it's subject to erosion. So the island is kind of eroding away with tidal waves and increase of the sea level. Um, every 20 to 30 years, part of the island goes under the sea. So people who are living there have to relocate to another area of the island. And all of the teachers that I have talked to have had to um, change their schools because schools were broken down by the sea, changed their homes twice or thrice in their lifetime. So it's 
And that is another reason the government doesn't invest in the infrastructure, because any infrastructure that will be built will inevitably go under the sea. <laughs> they don't even have proper roads in the island because everything just breaks away. So it's a very, um, it's very nice, actually, to not have any kind of modern facilities. That's what I think. Um, <laughs> it is, it is. Um, Always? Um, uh, I think it's good for a kind of a break because I went from all of this to suddenly that. And I don't know why it felt really, really peaceful and calm to me. It's not that they don't have anything. It's just that you don't have television or you can't charge your phone. But I think you can deal with those kinds of things. You don't have fridge. You don't have a fridge. But they cook every... Um, you know, they cook the, uh, the food every day. So it's everything's fresh. <laughs> I really loved it over there. I really did. Uh, I want to go back too. So let's look at the people. This is Rashid. So about 50%. He represents 50% of the children in the island. He is one of the children that do not attend school because he has to work in his family's, uh, family's restaurant. Um, this is a restaurant for the tourists. So he helps in generating income for his family. So he is one of those marginalized children that United Nations talks about who does not attend primary education. This is Rashid's home. So you can see the water is very close to his home and it will go under into the sea any day. So he is an, in a very uncertain position. He doesn't have, he doesn't know what to do, where to go. And this is about 50% of the children in the island are in this situation. So Maybe they don't go to school. No, they don't go to school. I think it's because of the uncertainty that comes with all of it. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Mm. Do if they have a school on the island? Yeah, lots of schools on the island. Teachers are trying very hard. Teachers are very engaged, as I'll show you. So lots of schools, but there are children who are left out. Um, mainly for working in um, the family's restaurants and generating income. So people below the poverty line are not that interested to send their <laughs> children to school. And the photojournalist who kind of documented Rashid's whole, uh, Rashid's life for a few days. This is what, how he describes. Um, so Rashid is one of the typical Hathiya children who work at their family restaurants in the evening hours and try to discover their freedom during the daylight hours. The smokes of the restaurant kitchen are his everyday companion. His future is not lit brighter than the kitchen lights which run on batteries. So that is the actual situation after all of that. Um, let's keep Rafid in our minds for some time. Let's move on to another story. So this is the story of Hina, who was one of the best digital teachers. So she was born, raised and educated in Hatia. She has never been out. She's never been out for work or education out of that island. Um, she works as a primary school teacher in Hatia. She completed her ICT training in 2012 and has received the Best Teachers Award, I think, in 2015. Um, she introduced herself. This intrigued me a lot. She introduced herself by saying that I am a teacher of children, but I am a student of nature and I live in a faraway island. Um, so I thought that was beautiful. She, from the very beginning, showed this sense of connection to nature. Nature meant a lot to her. So she has this inside of her. Um, and her home has eroded twice in her lifetime. So um, by the sea. And once it was destroyed by a very powerful cyclone that happened. So she also, but despite that, she feels very connected to the natural um, way of the island and she said that she does not see this as a challenge she says that this is my way of living this is part of who I am all of this erosion all of this tornado and cyclones and everything she's kind of feels that she's part of it so and she has a great respect to nature um, as I 
went through her interview, all she talked about every few minutes was nature, the trees, and how she likes the wildlife and how she likes the island. So that's a bit about Henna. Uh, excuse me, how old is she? Um, I didn't ask her age, but she's been teaching for about, she says, 25 years now. But she started teaching after, um, while she was just after her undergraduate degree. So that kind of, she's an experienced teacher. That's what I can say. It's quite an experienced teacher. Well, can I ask why, why, who asked the question? <laughs> Uh, Michael, why was why 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 did you ask that? I'm intrigued. Yeah, that's because that might uh, influence her way of life. She, life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so the, the fact that she's a, a little bit older and is used to the natural environment is that okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's interesting, isn't mm -hmm. it? So now let's look into the local pedagogy. So that's henna, and how do they teach in this island? Uh, first thing that has been in the island for hundreds of years is their use of natural or resources that they bring outside from the home to help students learn hands-on in the classroom. So this is a picture from Henna's classroom where she used leaves, marbles to teach subtraction, multiplication, division, addition to primary school children. And she says that the children are really enjoy these sessions when they're using these things locally resourced things in the classroom to teach these concepts hands-on. Now, this is not given in the textbook. Teachers are supposed to teach by the textbook, but she says that she is naughty sometimes and does things that are not in the textbook, like this. Um, she also um, arranges, draws on natural resources. So she arranges these story sessions with students where the students share stories of what good things they've done or what good things they've seen other people do um, in the past few days. And she feels that that is very, very important. That's her sense of education. And although that's not anywhere in the textbook, she has kind of struggled with the school committee to give her half an hour after school to let her do that storying session with students in the local language, using a local way of communication we called Golpo. So it's very local, the things she does. And this is her sense of education. And she's struggling to get these recognized. Um, as I said, she's also very much connected to nature. So although her textbook doesn't have things like tell children to plant trees and everything, she feels that she needs to do it. So in the extra time that she struggled to get from the school, she also uh, plants trees with her children. Her school doesn't have any field or anything. So she used the, she uses the roof of the school. So she brought some plants and students plant trees. They look after it. And she says that from this, students can learn how plants grow. So, and this is what Henna's sense of education is, although it's not recognized. Or, and this is how it was going on before that digitalization came in. Now, um, this is also another thing. She feels very strongly about social justice. So remember that the students had to talk about every day about a bit of good, something good that they have done. And she says that after starting this, one day she saw her students helping a very old blind man. He somehow went, to, came into the school and they helped him out and they they came to her and said that, can we take this person to his home because he's lost his way? And she said, wait a minute, I need to capture this moment. And it was so, it, she said it was such a proud moment. She also shared it with me. Um, and this is what she said, that those who used to steal birds, eggs and chicks, these students, would throw stones at beehives, cats and dogs, used to tear the tails of the grasshopper, uh, grasshopper apart. And they would make fun of differently abled people have changed slowly. 
Now they do not do these and also prevent others. They teach others. May our future generation be full of humanity. And I think these quotes, we were talking about actually her use of the digital, but throughout my time and engagement with my data, I think that these are very important. These kind of indicate what her sense of good education is buried underneath the textbook and the curriculum and this digitalization and everything. Um, now let's look into, so that's what Hina believes or Hina does, struggles to do, and these are marginalized practices of education. Now let's look how the digital interacted with Hina. So that's also a very interesting story. Hina is not here, but these are um, female primary teachers from last year who received the Digital Teachers Award, all from Hatia. <laughs> so that's a very big recognition. And the island is recognized as an empowered island nowadays for women teachers. Empowering. Um, so what happened is when the government introduced technology, the local community in the island did not accept technology. So the community felt that technology is something that does not sit on the values of education that the community has. So the community sees education as something very sacred. The teacher will come in, the teacher will talk. There's no place for what they said, cinema in a classroom. Cinema takes away from the sacredness of education. So as the government was saying interaction, enjoyment and fun, that was not accepted by the local community. And you can see as Hina was, Hina wanted to change her education even more. She wanted to use technology, but the community and the head teacher put a ban on using technology in the classroom. Because technology had this sense of being something bad, when she wanted to make PowerPoints sitting at home, um, she lives in a joint family. Her in-laws, her husband, her family said, no, you cannot use technology at home. It's something bad. Look after, after the children, do the household chores, everything, but do not use technology. It's not something good. So what she used to do, um, being the kind of person, creative person she is, she still felt that urge to create. And why she, she said that she felt that urge to create because she said from when she was growing up, she was never allowed to do something or create something. As a woman, she was always told, you don't do this. You don't do that. What you do has no value. So although she was doing all of that, the head teacher wasn't very happy with her of all the extra things that she was doing at school. And she feels that that is because I'm a woman, because women are not valued. And even when she became a teacher, the government gave her a textbook, gave her a curriculum, and you do exactly this. You don't need to exercise any agency. You don't have the talent. You don't have the training. Just follow us. So she said, I felt very um, constrained in what I was doing all the time. For the first time, the government gave the PowerPoint to her and said, OK, you do whatever you want to create interest and interaction and fun in the classroom. So she kind of took advantage of that space. She wanted to take advantage of that space. And she said, I wanted to create, but no one was letting me create. So what she did is she improvised. She used to get up at 2 a.m. at night, make the PowerPoint, upload it in the website and go to sleep again. So although she wasn't using it in the classroom, she thought that if I can create something and some teacher somewhere else can use it, I'm happy with that. And she was working so much. She was engaged so much. She wanted to create so much that one day she got um, recognized as the best digital teacher. Now that comes from the capital and there's a big media coverage and she has to go to the capital to receive that award from the prime minister. She's all over the newspapers. So that kind of created a stir in this very far away island. They thought, okay, what happened just here? Maybe what she's doing is really, really useful or else why all of this recognition? And the minute she got recognition, the minute all of 
the things she was doing was kind of being recognized by the head teacher, by her family, by the other teachers. Now she had the agency to do what she felt was good for education or what she should do as a teacher. So you can see the relationship between technology in this context is not directly to learning, but it's interacting in a very different way in the context. And this is what she says. So she says, even before when I did not have training, I didn't do it. My students used to tell their guardians how fun my classes were, how I sing and recite to them. So she has that sense that what she did even before had value. And the students went to the guardians and told them that she's a good teacher. But, but now I see not only the children say things like this, the guardians praise me as well. My husband's colleagues tell him about me that your wife has become the best teacher. That is why he is very happy that I have done a good job. My in-laws and other teachers say the same thing too. So the society kind of accepts her now. So there was a sense of good education before, but it was not recognized. After integration of technology in a very non-linear way, it did give her some kind of agency to do what she believes in doing. Um, and this is very important because the, this sense of agency that the teachers gained has now kind of changed collectively the website that we were talking about. Remember that the website, if I take you back to that. Uh, okay, gosh. Yeah, okay, here. So you can see the website at first was all about the PowerPoint. So PowerPoint's getting uploaded, PowerPoint's getting downloaded and being shared. And this was a place, this focal place was an area for advertisements from the government or kind of advertising the best teacher and the PowerPoints. So model PowerPoints that the government called. Now, after teachers have this sense of agency, the teachers came together, rural teachers came together and said, change this place, put the PowerPoints to one side and use this focal place to show two minute videos. <laughs> These are videos of improvisations that we make in our schools. We want to change our schools. We do not need any funding, but we want to share with other teachers and learn from other teachers how to change the school with the resources that we have. So this is now kind of showcasing the changes teachers feel should come to education. So let's see. And these are not always related to technology and learning, but they have a very different sense of what education should become. So I have some examples of so that space is now called My School, My Dreams. This is a shot from Henna's video. So these are shot with cell phones, two minute videos. What Henna did in her school is she created a cleanliness committee. Most of the students in Henna's school come to school after working in the field. So their parents are farmers. They go to work in the fields in the morning. Either children go to the field with them and come to the school with soil all over them. Or because the mom and dad are away, these little children cannot get ready properly and they just come to school. So what Henna did is she brought a mirror, a comb, um, a bit of soap, towels, and made this cleanliness committee with other students. So all the students, what they do is when they arrive in the school, they get ready together, wash up, wash their hands, everything clean and then they enter the school. So that is Ch Henna's change in her school. Um, this is from another teacher who thought, I don't want fixed benches in my classroom at all. So she, he put away all of the fixed benches. He borrowed these traditional mats weaved by the village mothers. We call it a patty. So he put them on the floor and then all the village people came together to kind of create a forest feel in the classroom. And they thought that is how our children are going to feel good in the classroom and enjoy the classroom and enjoy the environment. So that is another improvisation done by um, the village people and the teachers together under this scheme, My School, My Dreams. Um, and then there's another teacher who thought that I want to make a green school. 
we need more plants all around the school. That might engage the students and that is what students need to learn. So all of the students, the teachers and the village people came together. They're planting. They got plants from the village people. They're using extra cow dung from the farmers and the villagers. And he is making a green school. That's his school. That's his dream. May I just yeah. interrupt at this yeah. point? Um, yeah. So these are normally farmers' children. Yeah. So they will have a sense yeah, of how, how to grow do. things. Yes. So, so they're, they're working together, yeah. pooling their knowledge yes. to do these things. It's not like the teacher is teaching them. No, what but to the do teacher them. is creating, taking the initiative. Mm -hmm. And the whole village, in most cases, what intrigued me is the whole village is now, they're not against it. They come together and they, they see the sense in it. They think that, yes, my child should stay at school after school and they're going to plant it. They're going to stay at school after school and they're going to do this. So these improvisations are localized improvisations of education. Mm -hmm. They're not directly related to learning as the government visualized at the beginning, but th that's a different kind of sense of sustainability or sustainable development that teachers have, although they don't articulate it as such. I feel it's their sense of what education should be about, what development should be about, what children should be learning. And they're coming out of the curriculum in that way. So that is the whole case. Um, now, let's go into the prompts, right? Any questions before yes. that? Yes. Quick. Let's give you a round of applause. I, um, we'll have a break shortly, but in the meantime, there's a lot of richness going on there that Ivy has done many talks for me and, and they're always uh, very rich and uh, bring a lot to our understanding of what learning is going to be in different contexts. At this point in time, does anybody have any questions before we go into the break? Yeah. Two here. Three. Yeah. Any more? Four. Okay. <laughs> so that, that, yes. that was enough to yeah, go on. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, I just want to know why. So there are the kids that don't go to school and the kids that do go to school. The kids that go to school, are they from families that are slightly more privileged or is it just parents? No, it's just parents, parents. not taking. Sorry, can I just check? Did you hear the question at the back there? Mm -hmm. Did you hear the question? Okay. Parents seeing this as not valuable. Even the kids that come to school, their parents aren't involved. The teachers told me that we have to go, they're not attending when they become, when they don't, because generating income is more important than sending them to schools. I forgot to show you, there are lots of, if, we, if I could show you the main website, there are lots of initiatives by the teachers, female teachers going from home to home, home to home, home to home, asking the mothers to send their children to school. But that was, they don't know anything about SDG4. It's just that being in that context, they feel that they want to do it. One of my teachers has arranged a mother assembly, as she calls it. Every month she goes around, brings all of the mothers in the island to her school, talks about why teacher, why they need to come to school. And I think that's a very contextual, localized kind of way to include these children. So there are lots of initiatives in that my school, my dream area. It's very, very interesting. And most of it, as you said, is connected to bringing these um, children who are left out into school in a local way. Yeah. Um, thank you for touching and sharing, but I'm sorry I may ask two no, main it's questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, um, I think Hannah, as a teacher, she's very passionate and yes, she is. nice and kind. Yes. But I think that is not suit for every teacher thing. You know, because they they may think their PowerPoint is like actual work mm. they they may mm. need to do. Mm. So in the past, they may just need to bring a book to their class, mm. and now they need to do PowerPoint. Yeah. So where where can uh, their 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 the teachers motivation from? Mm. So how can the government motivate the teachers mm. to do their 
the PowerPoint to use the multimedia、mm -hmm. because the teachers may not find the value of multimedia.、Mm -hmm. And I also think the change of Hannah's students is from multimedia. It's from the way that the Hannah used it.、Mm -hmm. It's because of the teacher itself.、Mm -hmm. And and the second question is that、um, so the quality、uh, education is to make the present education more effective, not to let the children who Can't attend the school, go to school, because I think the multimedia is kind of spend a large sum of money, and、mm. maybe the the、mm. effects of them it's、mm. very little.、Mm. So how、mm. about make the tuition fee? There's no tuition <laughs> fee. Primary school is okay. So,、yeah. uh, so, so I think the key factor is just like your question is to let the parents know the value of education.、Mm -hmm. It's not to make their the present classroom、mm -hmm. more、mm -hmm. multimedia like、mm -hmm. that.、Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, I'm sorry for the question. No, it's okay. So if I get the first question right, it's about non ICT using teachers, and in my data, non ICT te using teachers are a big force. Because they are the ones who are still providing the problems for ICT using teachers. So if a teacher wants to use ICT, Hena is still struggling against that non ICT using teachers. The non ICT using teachers are usually the head teachers, senior education officers, and even more senior teachers than her who don't want to use technology, and they don't even want to experiment with it. So even now. There are one one of the teachers that I have. She can't use technology in her school because the voice of the non ICT using teachers, just as you said, that technology may or may not. We have been doing other things for years. Why do we need technology now? I、uh, it's more work for me. I don't want to do it. But the government says we thought no one's going to take up technology, but this. The government said by giving that recognition has worked a lot. Teachers have gone out of their way in different ways to help、um, uh, provide effective learning in their sense, and、um, they also draw on multimedia learning literature a bit, which says that if used properly, the visual can actually、um, complement the verbal, and people can understand and learn a bit better. Through multimedia, so they do have a bit of research behind what they are doing. They have trained teachers on how to use multimedia, how to create multimedia. But the thing they did is they did not put,、uh, like the textbook says, you have to do this after this. But with PowerPoint, they said that told the teacher you can go and create. And、um, uh, if we go back to SDG four, so SDG four is about inclusion, bringing all those children into school, but it's also about quality education. Remember, they said that most of the children are not achieving the standard of education, reading, maths, and everything. So that standard needs to be brought up. So that is also part of quality education. So for bringing up the standard, the government thought multimedia, but they thought that it could also create interest to bring all of those children into school. So they thought that this is going to do two things at one time in the budget that the government has. Does that make sense? Did、yeah. it answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We have a couple of questions up at the back. Alex and somebody else had a question. Oh, oh, all right. Okay, we've got right. We've got. We'll take、yes. five questions, and we must have a break. Okay. Yes. We'll go I'm with really、you. interested in how did the female teacher persuade、uh, their mother on island to send their children to go to school because、uh, there's a disaster and can happen any time. And、mm. yeah, I'm really interesting. What exactly they explain to. The mother on the island. Oh,、uh, good. Did you hear at the back? We're interested in how the the female teachers go out and and、uh, engage the parents、yeah. um, in in what is a very precarious set of situations. Yeah. Well, so that comes to the limitation. My data collection ended in ended last year, so and、uh, this is happening just now. Okay, so. I'm seeing what's happening because I'm still connected to the teachers. I'm connected to them via Facebook. They're posting different things, but that's not in my data, so I couldn't go in and ask 
what are you talking about? But I can see every day from what I see on their Facebook posts and what they write in conjunction with their post. First, they say that they're going home to home. Now, a teacher is a very respected person in these communities. So when a teacher comes to someone's home, the parents take it very um, seriously. Before this, Hannah didn't go to anyone's home. She thought she herself is struggling all the time. She thought that she doesn't have any agency. But after this, Henna thought, okay, wait a minute. I have this recognition. People listen to me. I want to go to different homes and talk to these mothers. And the mothers were listening to her. So that recognition kind of mediated through technology into the context. So Henna goes, everyone listens what she has to say. And they take her seriously. That's one thing. The second thing she says that what she does is she arranges a mother assembly. All the mothers come to that afternoon to the school. They sit down on the floor. They share food. It's a kind of a community thing. And the mothers who are sending their children to school talk to the mothers who are not sending their children to school. So everyone kind of coming together, but in a very local way. It's called the Mahashamabesh or the mother assembly, she calls it. And seeing her, I see now other teachers are doing the mother assembly. And I don't know why they thought that they need to bring in the mother rather than the father. But that's how the female teachers kind of went on about it. And because I didn't have any interviews regarding what they're doing now, I can't give you more insight than that. Yes. I'm going to go to the yeah. Then to Alex. Then we'll take a final question. Then we'll have a break. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can always send your questions yeah. to me via email. I would love to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. So my question is about in your country, um, have you already changed um, teacher-centered approach to learner-centered oh. approach? Because in my country, in my old school, we are trying to use flex, uh, flipped classroom, but we didn't, um, but it, that it didn't go well because um, our teacher trying to. Um, transfer their approach from um, teacher center to children's uh, center, but we just uh, didn't get use of, of it, and it it actually didn't increase the quality of education. In so, in the sense of yeah, effective learning. learning. Yeah, right. oh, okay. So so we're talking about the how you move from a teacher centered to a more student centered yeah, yeah, uh, right. approach and the problems with that drawing on your own experiences yeah. trying to institute a flipped classroom approach for those of you who are doing blended learning. Okay. So what happened I wouldn't say that it's a fully student centered approach not at all. No. It started here student centered is here and there's this whole continuum in the middle. Mm -hmm. So maybe from here it in terms of exact classroom pedagogy when Hina is in the class with her PowerPoint, there is some change. She wants to make students talk more. Mm -hmm. She tries to do more activities where students are grouped together. But I wouldn't say that it's student centered as we say. I would say that it's on to that side. Rather than the PowerPoint classrooms, I would say that the activities she's doing now, like the Golpo session, you share stories of doing good things. That's completely student-centered. Mm -hmm. Then um, the trees, remember? The yeah. students go outside, bring in the trees. <laughs> They're seeing how it's growing. That, to me, is teacher-centered. But her PowerPoint classrooms, I wouldn't say student. is... Uh, sorry, student-centered. Mm -hmm. So she does have a sense of what student-centered is, but that's not completely transferred into her mm -hmm. PowerPoint classrooms per se, but I would say that it's on a on continuum somewhere, mm -hmm. but not completely student-centered, no. Enabling, enhancing, transformative yes. blend, this notion of transformative learning. Two more questions, then we take a break. So we go to Alex at the back, and then to yourself at the front here. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very interested uh, in how uh, five teachers from Hakia were, were uh, recognized for becoming, you know, making some of the best PowerPoints. Did you get a sense that they formed relationships with each other outside of the, the technology? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question. And that's very important. So mm -hmm. I talked about the first female teacher. 
So her, um, she it belonged to Hatia. And when I went through Hena's interview, Hena talked as her, that first teacher um, as a hero. And she said, I got this PowerPoint training. I came back, but I couldn't do anything because I had chores. I had this problem at school, that problem at school. And one day that first digital teacher came to our school and said, Hena, I know that you're a very creative, passionate person. You have it within you. Why don't you try this? And she said that then I felt I should do this. And every day when she used to cross paths with that teacher, she would come and ask her, are you working yet? Let me help you. What do you want me to do? And she said that through her, this constant asking on the way about, I, and she was continuously telling me that I could do it. And then I did it. And then we got together and I talked just like she talked with me, with other teachers that you can do it. And by that time, because two, three teachers had already got this recognition, other teachers were coming to know that, okay, uh, they're doing it, I can do it, because they saw these people in front of their eyes, they were communicating, they were interacting. So yes, I think that that community together has a be very big role to play in bringing other female teachers forward. Thank you. I'm not very familiar with Bangladesh, this country's uh, environment things. And I feel that, uh, as you said, like the country is very um, placed to do the uh, quality education things. They want to introduce multimedia to all of yes. the country. Yes. But it seems like Hatia is very special. It's like the local government can control the education system. They, they don't want to use multimedia, so they don't. So they don't mm. say, they ask yeah. the headmasters, the headmasters can yeah. say, I don't want to. Yeah. But the government actually, the country, yeah. is actually accepting this system. Yeah. So I'm a little bit curious about this. Uh, why now you're overriding why? the government. Yeah. Did you hear at the back? So we're thinking about, this is a very good question. We're thinking about um, got them, um, the policy at government level and how that relates to policy at the localized level where a lot of people are opposed to using any sort of technology yeah. and what this all means. Really nice question. It relates to yeah. our discussion. Yeah. We've got time for it. Yeah. yeah. So what happens is when the policy was drafted, remember the government said we want to give the teachers agency in this. This is the teacher space. I'm creating a space. I'm going to give everyone training. So that 14 day training is compulsory. But after that, well, the, I talked with the director and the director said, I don't want to force teachers into coming in. I want to motivate teachers into understanding the value. Now I will give them time to develop that understanding of technology, but I'm not going to force because I think that when teachers are motivated by themselves and understand it for themselves, they can come in. That's why the government arranges the training ask teachers to come and do the training, does all of these awards and recognition, but he said, I'm not going to force. They can do it if they want, they can't do it if they want. It's a, if it's something really good, it will be taken up in the way the teachers want it. And that's why even that space is in the hand of the teachers together. So the government has, regulates it, looks after any problems or glitches, but the government says, this is the teacher's space, we don't want to interfere. So that's why they don't kind of override if someone or don't force someone exactly to do all of this. So, so it, can I understand it's like the government sort of uh, rewarded these female yes, teachers yes. to change the people's yes, ideas yeah. freely, yeah. not force them. No, to not force them. Yeah, that's what he said. And I thought that that was very important. Yeah, that's I what the director that, yes. said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Abby, thank you very much. Yeah. So the sustainability goals, they're, they're separate as a means of helping us understand what all of the potential components of sustainability are. But in reality, they're all interconnected, right? And that's a very important point to take away with you. And I, get, I, I, I sent you a link to an article, which if you haven't read it after this session, I would um, prompt you to go away and have a look at it, because I think it relates to some of the things that Ivy is saying. 
Um, but um, Nole talks about two fundamental assumptions that underlie the sustainability development goals. Some people question that notion of development, but that's a different issue. The first assumption is that any effort to restore and preserve planetary eco eco ecology right. can be deemed successful only if it addresses the profound social and economic inequities that create suffering on the planet today, right? So when we talked a long time ago about the social, the economic, the environmental, or the environmental, the social, and the economic, what we're doing is thinking about several things in combination. So a couple of weeks ago, somebody said, can we discuss financial sustainability? And I thought, yes, but financial sustainability is related to all of these different things, right? And this is one of the things that um, it's useful to get a real sense of uh, uh, on this course, and I think you already are doing. The other thing I wanted to say is that was a very beautiful, rich um, um, presentation showing the complexities of teaching in a particular environment and the policy level, the supra policy level, so um, um, the local, the individual dynamics of what's happening there. And that, that, that's, that's beautifully rich. And the other thing I wanted to say, and I have talked about this on a couple of occasions, but you can see that in doing these things, there are lots of challenges for the people in, 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 in Bangladesh at all levels, from policy level to local level. And the implementing these things and instituting these things, coming back to your question, Anna, about you know, um, the transformative learning, takes time, takes energy, and you need to solve problems. So in your assignments, in your presentations, when you're thinking about what you might do, what I also want you to think about are the potential constraints or impediments to doing that, right? So it's not the shiny, this is what I do in the best possible universe. It's that this is what we would do, but we need to take account of the potential issues. Right. Those are the things I could say a lot more, but we've got a little bit of time, so let's have a brief conversation. Um, uh, both Ivy and I asked about quality education. So did anybody talk about quality education? And would anybody like to share their thinking with Ivy, Alex and I? What's your understanding of quality education? In relation to what we're talking about here. Any thoughts will be fine. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I thought quality education is that high enrollment rates. Because mm. uh, you mentioned that nearly uh, 58 million children can't access to education, and especially in the rural area. So uh, quality, ed quality, ed yeah, quality, quality, ed quality education is that a high enrollment Right. and narrow and low gap, narrow gap between rural and urban area. And next one is a uh, qualified education, a uh, qualified teacher. Um, and yeah. So I don't know if you heard at the back, quality education it, for this group relates to high enrollment rates in schools. So the number of children and maybe adults that are going to a learning context to, to learn. The narrowing the gap between the rural and the urban, actually, which is a lot of that. Yeah. And the final one was having qualified teachers. Good. Anybody else want to? We have a very different version here. And I'd like to please Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the good, good quality of education is just stand for up and speak to everybody, please. Yeah. Uh, I think the quality of education is means you have a chance to en to enjoy the development of the education, and you from the school you can be a good person. 
we were better life and uh, find a decent job. So, but the first thing is you should solve the poverty, like the Bangladesh. The first mm -hmm. thing you need to solve is the power, the poverty, I think. So when we were talking, could you hear at the back? Yeah, becoming uh, very interesting. Becoming a better person. person. Yes, as you know, uh, sustainability. If we think about the values we talked about a couple of weeks ago, there's universal values. You've got becoming a better person as a part of that. Um, uh, getting a job when you leave, which comes from a different set of values. Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think I'm not right or wrong, so I just want to uh, start this question with the purpose of education, that is public good. So I think maybe for the quality of education, that is two parts. The first part is the quantity, is the more possibility for the students, without the chances to access education, there's no meaning about the quality of education. Mm. So the first part, I think, is first, you have the possibility, you have the chance to go to the university or to go to the education. So that's the first part. The second part is the quality. So the true quality, I, I think maybe is focused on the personal needs and focus on the different kinds of chances to have the different flowers about the education. So I think maybe it's two parts. First, you have the chance and then you can have your on your own okay so so the personal personal meaning and how you can personalize education and the opportunities to engage with education which is what you were talking about and the mm -hmm. teachers i wonder um alex if you have anything to say on on that that lovely point about opportunities um for education yeah, I, I think the uh, opportunity is very, um, very at, at the heart of education as a public good. Um, it's these are I'm very interested in uh, Martha Newsband's work and uh, Amartya Sen's work, who think about um, uh, human capabilities and the opportunities people have in their life to develop and if people have the opportunities uh, lots of things flower from that mm -hmm. um, and that that's inspired me to think uh, in in pragmatic ways about practicality mm -hmm. uh, so yes uh, thank you. you you mentioned Martha Newsbaum Martha Newsbaum has written a book called Creating Capabilities and it's a lot about the opportunities that you're talking about, the equality that you're talking about, and how this relates to us as human, as hu individual human beings. It's a really nice book on, on exactly the question I think that you're asking. Yeah. Could, could I just add also another thing? Something I think is quite important to, to think about in a, in a modern world is to think about opportunities beyond finance. Mm. Finance often structures what opportunities people have in their lives, mm. but finance doesn't represent many people in the big scheme of things. Mm. So. Mm. So, so paying for education as opposed to having opportunities yes. where there's no money changing hands. Mm. Yes. Mm. And that's relating the SDG goals of poverty, welfare, education you can see how you begin to you know health mm. all of these things you can start mapping that onto understandings yeah. of this maybe you know um a degraded environmental landscape things like this any other thoughts on the quality of education i think the uh, the highest level of quality education is about self-awareness is to let the children know who they are and who they like, mm -hmm. and they can pursue what they like. They can have more possibilities and chances to be what they want to be like. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, 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 the developing self, uh, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that. Um, so I, I can talk about that from the perspective of 
henna. So her sense of self at the beginning, she didn't have agency or that sense of self, but through the website or through the mediation of recognition, she developed that sense of agency within herself. And I think that's an opportunity as you were talking about realizing your capabilities in some way. So if that could also happen to children mm. to exercise their agency and become, you know, who, as you said, who they wanted to be, almost developing an identity and becoming aware of that identity. I think that is really very important. So that in some extent happened with Hena. She developed a sense of herself. She developed a sense of agency, but absolutely that needs to happen with children too. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just going to read another bit out from the Nole, which I think relates to what you're talking about. The Demela, uh, they're talking about child's, children's parents, okay. But there's a broader, the development of respect for the child's parents, his or her own cultural identity, language and values for the national values of the country in which the child is living, the country from which he or she may originate, and for civilizations different from his or her own. And then Noli goes on to talk about the values which relate um, to the local, to um, sense of self. Okay, we in sustainability terms, we talk about self, other, the planet. And we see all of those things as interrelated. The development of self is contingent on a flourish, a flourishing uh, planet. So, so what people in sustainability or education are trying to do is draw those things together. Because one of the big things in Ivy's, so is, you know, we've got this planet, We've got influences, in this case, climate change on this little um, 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 island um, in uh, just off Bangladesh, a part of Bangladesh. Um, so we've got these planetary influences and then we've got everything that happens within those planetary influences. So when we're talking about sustainability and we're talking about all of these things, you know, what's happening on that island environmentally is an important facet of what's happening. And you can see that that's, you know, this love of nature, this, yeah. this you know, the, the fact that, you know, your house disappears. All of these things are things that you might be thinking about in terms of sustainability. So the, the planetary, the localized, what's happening at school level and things like that. <laughs> Um, if I remember correctly, reading uh, Victor Nolley's work, he spoke about service learning. Okay. And part of what your presentation made me think of was that service learning and character education. Okay. People learning about themselves, the way they're acting in the world, and how the world is important for them. So when I help somebody else, I'm helping myself uh, as, you know, there, there are benefits, but uh, the way I treat my environment, discarding things, yes. leave, leaving rubbish, you know, I, I think uh, I learn more when I behave in better ways. Mm -hmm. I, I, I enrich my environment mm -hmm. by being rich. Mm -hmm. So I, it made me think of yeah. no way. Can, can the, the, we could have a much longer conversation? Unfortunately, we can't because we're out of time. Can we all thank Ivy in the first instance? Thank you very much, thank you very much Ivy. Uh, and thank you, Alex, for joining in and talking about Ragged and, and, um, <laughs> and doing the. Uh...